Well, welcome everybody to uh, Sigma Xi's first lecture of the season. Uh, my main job is uh, to introduce our program chair, but I'm Bill Simpkins. I'm the president of this organization this year. And uh, for those of you that don't know anything about Sigma Xi, Sigma Xi is an honorary research society for scientists and engineers. We have an active chapter of I think 300 people that pay dues every year, many of whom we don't see. So if you're a lapsed or fallen away member of Sigma Xi, please come and join us. Uh, this is actually the first of four lectures that we generally do during the year. Uh, and these are, this particular one by Felicia is a distinguished lecture. They have a, a series that they send out from the national office. Our next lecture after Felicia will be Carl Geschneider on November 20th who's going to talk about um, magnetic refrigeration and cooling and energy efficient and green looking technology for the 21st century. Uh, and then after the first of the year, we're going to have John um, Carberry from DuPont talk about sustainable industry in a ch changing society, and that's on February 26th. And then to round out the year, uh, the academic year, on April 30th, uh, there'll be the retiring president's address. I guess that's me. I have to come up with something for that uh, at the end of the year. And I'm not retiring from the university. I'm just retiring as president, hopefully. Um, so uh, like I said, the main job here is to introduce uh, Steve Kowaler now, who's going to uh, introduce our speaker for this evening. So Steve. Well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, many of you are refugees, I think, from liberal fascism, which just finished at the sunroom. Uh, we overlapped with the speaker at our dinner uh, earlier, and I'm sure you heard him just fine. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our, our Sigma Psi Distinguished Lecturer for the fall. Uh, Dr. Felicia Wu, as it says here, is a professor at the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. That's even longer than some of our department titles here at Iowa State. Uh, and the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, if I wanted to tell you all there is to know about Felicia in her still young career, uh, it would take most of the hour. So I'm just going to make the introduction very short. Now you know who she is. Uh, just one or two tidbits from her past. Uh, you will be honored to be hearing from a semi-finalist in the 19, do I, am I getting this right? Yes, 1994 Jeopardy Teen Tournament. Uh, <laughs> Felicia has, uh, as you'll see in her talk, a broad range of interests and expertise, and you need that kind of broad range of interest and expertise to, to address the many issues uh, that are concerned with ethanol production. So it's my uh, privilege, honor, and pleasure to introduce Felicia tonight. Thank you, Steve. So if you all have any questions at the end of the talk, phrase them in the form of answers and I'll give <laughs> questions back to you. It's a pleasure to come back here again. This is actually my third time at Iowa State University. I came here for the first time a year ago giving a lecture in the Big Map Symposium and then I had the chance to spend two weeks here as a visiting scientist over the summer. Um, Gary Monkfold in the Department of Plant Pathology had invited me to be here and I was working in the Seed Science Center during that time. So it's great to see many familiar faces again and also to have the chance to talk with all of you. Um, my talk today is on the environmental impacts of ethanol production. I come from a public health background. I'm a professor in a school of public health. Um, the field of ethanol and energy in general is not something that many public health professors work on. However, there are a lot of interesting and potentially concerning public health implications associated with ethanol production and other types of uh, fuel production and use. And what better place to start than by looking at the environmental impacts and what impacts that they might have on human health. So the guiding questions for this talk are two. First, what, how do the environmental impacts of ethanol production and use compare with those of gasoline? And second, what solutions and alternatives exist? I'll give you a very broad-based picture of the problem, and I think many of you here are probably ethanol experts, and are very good experts in some particular aspect of the problem, and so I hope that we'll have the chance to dialogue afterwards on it. Um, the, the outline of my talk will um, roughly follow four different points. First, I'll give you some background on the current state of energy. Mostly, I'll be focusing on the supply and demand of crude oil um, for transportation uses. Second, I'll give you some background on ethanol. 
Third, which is the longest part of my talk, I'll be discussing the environmental impacts of corn-based ethanol production and use. And finally, I'll be discussing some alternatives and potential solutions. So first, the current state of energy, both globally and in the US. I'll be discussing issues of production and consumption of crude oil, um, demand and supply dynamics currently in the world, and then US energy use and imports. Actually, I think I'm going to take this out if I can. There we go. I'm sorry? Oh, that, that would actually, yeah. So right now, we live in a situation in which there are improved living standards worldwide. Of course, this is an excellent thing. One of the consequences of this is that we have an increase in reliance globally on a finite supply of oil reserves for a variety of different uses, including transportation, heating, and industry. And when I say finite, what I mean is that new oil, thank you, Steve, forms in geological time scales, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. It's not by any means what one might call a renewable energy source. And as you can see in this graph on the left, this is a global production of crude oil in billions of billions of bar barrels per year. You can see that it's been increasing over the last several years. Um, the portion in green represents um, crude oil production from the top 12 producers around the world, which you can see in this pie graph to the right. So some of the major players are Saudi Arabia, Russia, the US, Iran, Mexico, and China. And the yellow parts of the bars represent crude oil production in the rest of the world. Right now, we're in a situation where total production pretty much mirrors total consumption at about 30 billion billion barrels per year. At this rate, the crude reserves, the reserves that we know exist, will potentially deplete themselves within the next 40 years. And we are one of the major culprits. We are currently, the US, the largest global user of oil energy. Although we use it fairly efficiently, meaning that for every unit of crude oil that we consume, we are producing a relatively large amount of GDP. However, increasingly, we're relying on imported crude oil. As you can see in the graph on the left, um, this graph represents our use, of our consumption of crude oil from 1950 to today. The parts in the, the green part of the bar represents the amount of crude oil that we're using that we produce domestically, whereas the blue portion of the bar represents the portion that we're importing. And you can see that over time, we're importing more and more crude oil. One of the concerns is that a high percentage of our import comes from politically unstable regions, and these include some of the countries that you see here in this pie chart. Iraq, Nigeria, Venezuela, and Saudi Arabia. Therefore, the security of our future energy supply is a really crucial policy issue today. Gasoline prices, as I'm sure you're all aware of, have increased dramatically since the 1990s. In this graph here, you can see the, the regular gasoline prices. The blue bar on the bottom is the nominal price. That's the price that you would um, see if you actually went to um, a gas station, whereas the real price is the price um, in $2,008. So you can see that since the 1990s, we've just you know, have experienced quite a um, large price increase in gasoline. Now that's going down a little bit because of the economic recession. And the high price of oil has had an impact on many, many different industries and sectors. Among others, the oil price has had a significant impact on agricultural production costs. There was a recent report that just came out from the US Department of Agriculture that showed that last year was the highest US farm production expenditures ever. Um, and in large part, this is because of the high petroleum costs. Petroleum has many different uses in agriculture, including for fuel, of course, for the production of fertilizers and chemicals, transportation, and indirectly also crop prices. And so as you can see from this table here, last year, total US farm production expenditures were $260 billion. And that re represents almost a 10% increase in expenditures from the year before. Now, if you look at a per farm average, you can see that um, those, those are some of the factors that are associated with, um, with the consumption of petroleum. Fertilizer, lime, and soil gone up by 26%. Feed, these are, are in terms of expenditures compared with 2006. Feed expenditures have gone up, fuel expenditures, and also expenditure for agricultural chemicals. 
And it's because of these types of reasons, and not just the effects in agriculture, but the effects across many different sectors, that the US government is looking toward the use of renewable fuels such as ethanol. Uh, President Bush, in his 2006 State of the Union address, stated that America is addicted to oil. And he is, uh, his administration has been very supportive of the use of ethanol as a renewable energy source that could displace some of our, uh, that could displace some of our dependence on foreign oil. The next portion of my talk is on the background of ethanol. What is ethanol? I'm sure many of you know, but I'm just going to go over that again. Ethanol production trends in the United States, the use of ethanol in our vehicles today, and the US policies that are supportive of ethanol production and use. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the molecular structure of ethanol, C2H5OH. Ethanol is also known as pure alcohol, grain alcohol, and drinking alcohol. In fact, what I found interesting, a little tidbit, was that the fermentation of sugar to form ethanol is one of the earliest organic reactions known to humanity, of course, for the purpose of drinking alcohol. Uses aside from alcohol consumption include um, uh, ethanol for flavoring and scents, ethanol uses in medicines, as a solvent in chemistry, and importantly for this topic, fuel. Importantly, 98% of the ethanol that we produce in the United States is um, corn-based. And so in, on the right, we have some statistics associated with both ethanol and corn production in the US. Last year, we produced 6.2 billion gallons of ethanol. And that took up 13% of the total amount of corn that we produced in the US. Now, in the year 2015, we're expected to produce 15 billion gallons of ethanol. So we're going to have to more than double what we produced last year. And it's going to be spending on um, taking up an even larger proportion of our corn production at 24%. And yet we're still expected to have more corn available for other uses then than we do now. And we're expected to do this through improving corn yield, from going from about 150 bushels per acre to 180 bushels per acre. And you can see in this rightmost column uh, potentials for the year 2020 in terms of ethanol production and corn yield. This graphic shows corn-based ethanol production in the United States. You can see that it's really taken off after about 2002, when there were many uh, different policies that went into effect supporting ethanol production. Just for some statistical tidbits, one bushel of corn, which is about 56 pounds, yields 2.7 gallons of ethanol. Therefore, to produce the 6.2 billion gallons we did last year, we needed to use 2.3 billion bushels of corn. The National Corn Growers Association has stated its US goal, which they call 15 times 15 times 15. Producing 15 billion bushels of corn, yielding 15 billion gallons of ethanol by the year 2015. And how is that going to happen? Well, here are all the existing and planned ethanol plants plotted across the US. The blue circles represent where the operating ethanol plants are today. You can see that they're concentrated right here in Iowa and also in southern Minnesota and some other parts around the Midwest. The red circles represent ethanol plants that are currently under construction, and the green circles represent the planned ethanol plants. From a personal perspective, what I find interesting about this map is that there is a green dot right over here next to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. We are not known for producing corn or ethanol. We produce steel and iron, but we're jumping onto the ethanol bandwagon too because we see how important this issue is. Now, ethanol is not meant to replace gasoline entirely, but to complement it. Namely, flex fuel vehicles, or FFVs, can take anywhere from 0 to 85% of a blend of ethanol mixed with gasoline. As you can see here in this top right picture, this is a picture of a 1908 Ford Model T. This is the earliest flex fuel vehicle that was probably ever produced in the world by Henry Ford. Um, in fact, this could take up to as much as 100% ethanol, or it could take 100% gasoline, or it could take any blend of the two. Today, the most common blends that you hear about are E10, which is 10% ethanol blended with 90% gasoline, or E85, which is 85% ethanol blended with 15% gasoline. In fact, 7.3 million US cars now in use are compatible with E85, out of a total of 65 million cars in our current fleet. So that's more than 10%. But interestingly, in a survey that was conducted three years ago, 68% of Americans who did own an FFV did not know that they did. It's not typically labeled on US cars. 
is quite different in Brazil, where there are 13.7 million E85 flex fuel vehicles in use, and they are well advertised all over the car. This is the fle an E85 flex fuel vehicle. Of course, there are some exceptions. This modern US Postal FFB has E85. You can't see it too well here, but it's advertising quite boldly the fact that it is an E85 vehicle. Most gasoline-powered cars produced in the US can use E10. Now, what sort of policy support has there been in terms of producing and using ethanol? In 2007, President Bush announced his 20 in 10 initiative, which is basically to reduce our overall gasoline consumption by 20% within the next 10 years. How are we going to accomplish this? Well, there have been three policy instruments, at least subsidies, congressional mandates to produce, and fuel economy compliance credits. Up until May of this year, um, refiners that blended ethanol with gasoline received a 51 cents per gallon tax credit. Now it's down to 45 cents per gallon. There have been a number of different congressional mandates to produce, and the most recent legislation has called for um, annual production of 36 billion gallons of ethanol by the year 2022. I mean, that right now we're at about six, so we're going to have to increase this, our ethanol production by six times within the next 15 years. The Department of Transportation provides what's called a fuel economy compliance credit for any new E85 vehicle produced until 2014. So that means that a Chevy S10 that ordinarily would be getting 25 miles per gallon counts for federal compliance purposes as though it were able to achieve 40 miles per gallon. That's at the federal level. Now there's also support at the state and the city level for production and use of gasoline. Last, uh, I'm sorry, of ethanol. Last year, Portland, Oregon became the first city in the United States to require that all gasoline sold within the city bounds contain at least 10% ethanol. And as of January of this year, now there are three states that require ethanol blends in all of the um, gasoline produced within their state, Missouri, Minnesota, and Hawaii. Now, um, the National Biofuels Action Plan was just released last week. It was actually, though, um, formulated over the course of the summer of this year. Um, the, there is an interagency biomass research and development board that consists of members from, for example, the US Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Over the next several years, they're interested in focusing on several action areas that include sustainability. How can we produce and use ethanol in a way that will be environmentally and economically sustainable over the next few decades? Feedstock production and logistics, conversion science and technology, how can we more efficiently convert feedstocks to ethanol, distribution infrastructure issues, basically a lot of the um, energy consumption takes place on both coasts, but a lot of the ethanol production actually takes place here in the heartland, blending issues and also issues of environment, health and safety. Many of these areas actually have a strong environmental component, and that's what I'm going to focus on next the potential environmental impacts of corn-based ethanol production. I'm defining environmental impacts very broadly here because I think it's important to look at all sides of the problem. So I'm going to be talking about impacts on our global food supply, air quality, soil and water quality, energy use, carbon emissions, and animal feed quality. I think you probably have all heard in the news about the food versus fuel debate. Namely, if we're taking our corn and we're turning it into fuel, does that potentially compromise our food supply? Because now that corn is not being used for um, food and it's not being used for animal feed. Well, the answer is not so much in the United States currently. Most US corn production is actually going toward animal feed and the corn, um, which we're now turning into ethanol, that we would have otherwise used for human consumption would be in production of high fructose corn syrup. However, what we have seen is roughly a 5 to 10% increase in meat prices, so prices of poultry and pork and beef, and also moderate increases in the prices of a lot of other different foods containing high fructose corn syrup, and that's actually a lot of different foods. But there might be some issue of food compromise in poorer corn trading nations, and I'll just use Mexico as an example. Mexico produces a fair amount of corn. Now, there are many different competing markets for that corn, including the US ethanol market. Now, if we're going to pay a much higher price 
for that corn than Mexican corn growers would otherwise receive for selling it for the production of tortillas or masa, then of course they would be more interested in selling it to the U.S. market. And this has actually resulted in a decreased supply of corn available for food in Mexico and in other parts of the world. In fact, there was a riot last year that took place over the skyrocketing price of tortillas. We also need to consider that our global food demand is going to probably double within the next 50 years. Our global population is going to increase to 9 billion people. Now that's not doubling our current um, population. We're at 6.2 billion on the earth right now, but meat consumption is going to increase and that's going to drive a lot of the increased need for food. Now this picture is not exactly related to meat consumption in China and India, but I just liked it because this is a sow that just decided to stop on an English road and nurse her piglets right in the middle of the road. Thankfully, nobody um, ran them over. Um, one, um, one factor about why meat consumption is so, um, requires so much corn is that one pound of meat requires 10 pounds of vegetable to produce. And this is, this roughly breaks down, at least in the United States and in many other parts of the world, to 90% corn, and so about nine pounds of corn and one pound of soybean meal. What we see in countries such as China and India is that the middle class is growing. There's no longer this dichotomy between the very rich and the very poor, but now there's a growing middle class that's increasing its meat consumption, which is placing a strain on corn production worldwide as well. For some basic statistics, now both China and India have over a billion people each. So I just did a back of the envelope calculation and I said, well, what would happen if every person in China and India, now this is talking about pure averages, ate on average just three pounds more meat per year. Um, my husband can eat that amount in one day, by the way. You would need 67 billion pounds more corn being produced every year, or about 1.2 billion bushels. That's 10% of current U.S. corn production. So what, what we can see here is that there's a high all-around demand for corn, for the uses of food, human food, for animal feed in order to produce meat to supply humans with food, and also to produce fuel. And of course, this is going to raise the prices. By how much? Well, you can see here in this graph to the left that the food commodity prices have risen by over 60% in the last two years. But I don't want to, certainly all the blame has, is not um, on ethanol production. There are many factors that also account for increased food prices, including first higher fuel prices in terms of increased inputs and transportation costs as I described earlier increased food demand, as I showed in the previous slide, and also the fact that in 2006 and 2007, there was a massive drought in many grain-producing parts of the world. Now, if you have a, a, a massive drought two years in a row, that pretty much depletes the surplus of food available. So that, that all had to do with um, food supply. The next topic that I'm interested in discussing is air quality and health, excluding for the moment carbon dioxide emissions. This photograph is of Los Angeles during the day. So it's kind of hard to tell that it is during the day because the smog is causing such a nasty uh, blanket of um, pollution in the air. Mostly this is caused by ozone. In fact, air pollution is the seventh leading cause of death worldwide. And it has, in fact, been linked to increased mortality risk if you are living in Los Angeles. So what are the impacts of burning ethanol versus gasoline in terms of changing air quality? What we know is that ethanol use increases the concentration of certain air pollutants, such as ozone, acetaldehyde, and formaldehyde. Specifically, it increases the air concentration of ozone by more than two times. However, ethanol use also decreases the air concentration of certain pollutants, including carbon monoxide, um, NO2 and SO2, benzene and butadiene. And there's no significant change in particulate matter emissions, so PM2.5 and PM10. Mark Jacobson did a study that was published last year that looked to see what would happen if all the cars in Los Angeles were switched to E85 vehicles. He predicted a 9% increase in ozone-related mortality from ozone-induced asthma, bronchitis, and heart attacks. Unfortunately, his particular model did not predict any decrease in illnesses that are associated with exposure to nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, benzene, or butadiene, for example, leukemia. So this is something we really do need to be concerned about as far as ethanol use. What about soil and water quality? I'm going to start with a, um, just stating a caveat that, in fact, many corn growers are adopting many practices to prevent excessive <laughs> depletion of soil and water quality. 
That said, it, we do need to be cautious about issues such as soil overuse. If we're just planting a lot of corn on a, a plot of land, what's going to happen in terms of soil erosion as well as nitrogen depletion? What about water use in comparison with gasoline? One gallon of ethanol production requires three to five gallons of water. This is actually not amazing or unusual in terms of industrial uses, but it is a problem for ethanol plants that are sited in arid regions where there are lots of competing uses for water. Also, if we have new dedicated fields, trying to irrigate them will also require massive amounts of water, and this is a problem for our water supply in the US. Water quality can also suffer because of the runoff of pesticides and fertilizers. In fact, every square kilometer of corn that is planted results in over a thousand kilograms of nitrogen fertilizer being washed into the Mississippi River and other nearby bodies of water. And this can lead to conditions such as hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. This above is a photograph of um, hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Hypoxia is a state of oxygen depletion, and what happens in that case is that either marine life will die or it'll move elsewhere. And so what this means from a commercial standpoint is that there are fewer fish, shrimp, and crabs available to the commercial and recreational fishers in that area. Oops. Let me go back. Now let's turn to the topic of carbon neutrality and biofuels. Um, the main concern in this case is carbon dioxide's contribution to global warming. I don't need to tell you that this is a hot topic. The new Oxford American Dictionary can tell you this. In fact, the term carbon neutral was their word of the year two years ago. So what does carbon neutral mean from an environmental standpoint? It means that any carbon emissions from fuel consumption can be offset by carbon capture and sequestration, for example, by planting crops. One of the things that we all learned, for example, in high school biology is that when we grow plants, they remove carbon dioxide from the air. Now, the carbon that's in the plants can be turned into biofuel, for example, ethanol, and then when that biofuel is combusted, it releases the CO2 back into the air. And so it can keep on cycling around like this. So if made proper, properly, biofuels can actually be carbon neutral, which would be a benefit over current gasoline. And in fact, this has been shown to um, be the case. My late colleague and friend Alex Farrell led a study that showed that per unit energy, ethanol trumps gasoline in a variety of different categories. Net fossil input, net fossil ratio, which is just um, the reciprocal of net fossil input, petroleum input, and greenhouse gas emissions. They were looking at three different cases, gasoline, corn-based ethanol, and cellulosic ethanol, which I'll talk about more later. Um, they were interested in calculating the megajoules of fossil fuel, crude oil, for example, needed for every megajoule of fuel that is produced. For gasoline, it's 1.19, and for both corn and cellulosic ethanol, it's um, less than one, which is a very positive sign. Also, the petroleum inputs are a lot higher for gasoline than they are for either type of um, ethanol, and also gasoline, on average, emits more carbon dioxide than either of the two types of ethanol. But that's only per unit of energy produced. We also need to consider land use change issues. Namely, where is all this land going to come from that we're going to plant biomass on? What's happening now is that land in previously undeserved, uh, uh, undisturbed ecosystems, especially in the Americas and in Southeast Asia, are being converted either to plant crops for biofuel production or to plant crops for food production, where previously agricultural land is now being term, used for biofuel. What happens is that when we convert native habitats to cropland, we release CO2 by two different mechanisms. One is that there's a massive release of carbon dioxide when we burn the plants and the soil. And then over the course of the next 50 years, the further decay of roots and leaves will continue to release carbon dioxide. And this summed together is the carbon debt that needs to be made up. Over time, biofuels like ethanol on this converted land can repay the carbon debts so long as their greenhouse gas emissions are less than the greenhouse gas emissions of the fossil fuels that they displace. Well, the, the next question would be, well, how many years does it take for biofuels like ethanol to repay the carbon debt? There are at least two prominent studies on this topic, one led by Tim Sergeyer, um, Dermot Hayes at Iowa State University was also a co-author on this paper, and one led by Joseph Fargioni in Minnesota. 
So what they were interested in calculating was, based on different ethanol production types, how many years does it take to repay this carbon debt of burning the land and then um, basically the, um, the amount of carbon dioxide that was released. For core-based ethanol as it currently is, it could take up to 167 years so that um, to repay the carbon debt. And that's because they made the assumption that we would be burning certain tracts of tropical rainforest and also certain tracts of um, grassland in order to be able to produce enough food and fuel. However, if we improve our corn yield and we also improve conversion technologies, then it might take only 34 years. And you can see what some of the other values are here. Now, um, Fargione et al. calculated slightly different values, and it's based on different assumptions. In this case, for example, they assumed that corn-based ethanol would be, we'd be burning central grassland as opposed to any tract of tropical rainforest, and so it takes only 93 years to, re to repay the carbon debt. But if we produce corn-based ethanol using abandoned land, it would only take 48 years. If we plant switchgrass in order to produce ethanol, then theoretically, it wouldn't take any time to repay the carbon debt. And you can see what some of the other values are here. Finally, I want to talk about ethanol production impacts on animal feed quality. Now, you might be wondering, well, what could the effect possibly be? Well, when we grow corn, it is often the case that fungi will colonize the corn, and these fungi sometimes produce toxins that are known as mycotoxins, that is, toxins of fun fungal origin. Now, when we take the corn and we ferment it to produce ethanol, whatever mycotoxins are originally in that corn get concentrated three times in the ethanol co-products. Now, that would be fine um, from a health standpoint if we just threw the co-products away, but we are, in fact, feeding 90% of our co-products to our livestock and poultry, and so and usually in the form of dry distillers, grains, plus solubles, or DDGs. So what is the potential impact to animal health? Well, the mycotoxins of concern in corn in the United States include fumonacin, aflatoxin, deoxynivalenol, and zearalanol, produced by the fungi seen here. Here are some lovely pictures of um, fungi colonizing corn. There are multiple adverse animal health effects. Fumonacin is mostly the um, mycotoxin of concern in this, in this part of the United States. Aflatoxin, which is the most potent liver carcinogen known for both humans and animals, is more of a problem in um, corn grown in the south and the southeast. And Don and Zierala are more problems in the northern corn belt. Um, Gary Munford and I did a study that we published earlier this year in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry that looked at the impact to the livestock industry just from the fact that when animals consume mycotoxins, they are actually smaller. Um, and this reduced weight gain actually has an impact on the livestock industry because um, th these industries typically sell their animals based on how much they weigh. And the annual loss is in the tens of millions of dollars annually, and that's just for reduced animal weight. We didn't factor in any other potential adverse health effects. Unfortunately, there's not much economic incentive to change this. Ethanol plants keep on wanting to sell their co-products to livestock producers because that makes up a significant source of their revenue. And livestock producers keep on wanting to buy it because right now corn costs so much that they would rather buy a cheaper feedstock. So this could be a real potential environmental problem. So to summarize, across those four, uh, six categories of potential environmental impacts, how does ethanol measure up compared to gasoline? In the case of food supply, both are implicated in higher food prices, and we can't really say you know, which is more responsible, but there are potential risks in poorer nations. As far as air quality, with the burning of ethanol, we can see increased respiratory mortality and morbidity risk. In terms of water use and quality, water use is about the same for both, but the risks to water quality from increased runoff are something we should be concerned about with regard to ethanol production. Energy use, um, ethanol does have a, a per unit improvement over gasoline, and as far as greenhouse gas emissions, over time ethanol can result in lower emissions if the right technologies are used and um, yield is improved. With regard to animal feeds, the production and use of ethanol results in potentially increased mycotoxin health risks to animals. Of course, corn growers are already adopting a number of environmental solutions to, um, to mitigate some of the problems I described earlier, including no-till farming, advanced fertilizer technologies, planting cover crops, and the use of crop genetic improvements, which I'll describe more later. But now let's turn to a new type of ethanol that's now being promoted by our administration, which is production of ethanol from lignocellulosic feedstocks. 
Lignocellulosic basically refers to any biomass that's composed of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, which is a cell wall component that helps to make the plant stiff. This can be converted to ethanol, and the sources that we're looking at to produce lignocellulosic ethanol include agricultural residues, for example, corn stovers or wheat straw. There are certain dedicated energy crops, such as switchgrass, hybrid poplars, or willows. We can produce it from wood residues, from sawmills or paper mills, or even from municipal paper waste. Um, by the way, this photograph here, when I looked at it from a distance, it looked a little bit like corn ears, but that's actually a close-up picture of cellulose. There are certain barriers currently to ethanol production from cellulosic sources. The sugars for fermentation are trapped inside the lignocellulose, and also there's a relatively high percentage of pentose, the five, car uh, five carbon ring sugars, as opposed to hexose in having cellulose, and yeasts find this more difficult to ferment. The solutions include a three-step process of pretreatment, enzymatic hydrolysis, and fermentation, as you can see in this case. In the last case, fermentation might require engineered yeast that can better decrease pentose. Now, lignocellulosic um, produced ethanol is seen as being a very positive change, partly because of the energy return on investment for ethanol. This is another hot topic as far as energy production that um, we're interested in calculating a variable called RE, the ratio of energy in a gallon of ethanol to the non-renewable energy that's required to make it. So RE is calculated as um, energy, in, energy output divided by energy input that's from non-renewable sources. Uh, Roald Haberschlag did a meta-analysis of different ethanol studies to look to see what the return on energy would be for core-based ethanol versus cellulosic ethanol, and he found that pretty much across the board, cellulosic ethanol has a much better return on energy. And that's why the May 2008 Farm Bill, one of the reasons, um, is now interested in providing subsidies and enormous amounts of research and development dollars for cellulosic ethanol production. Refiners would now get over a dollar per gallon for blending with cellulosic ethanol, and growers could get as much as $45 per ton of biomass, a cellulosic biomass. There are potential environmental benefits. You can grow cellulose crops on marginal lands. You don't have to use the most productive agricultural lands. We could reduce and yet not completely solve the food versus fuel dilemma. Perennial crops, such as the ones that I described, do not have high water and pesticide and fertilizer requirements, so that reduces input costs and that also reduces environmental burdens, and there's also a potential reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. There are some logistics that we need to overcome, though, for example, with regard to harvesting, storage, pre-processing, and transportation. And also, we need to consider from the ethanol plant standpoint, what do we do with the co-products? of lignocellulosic ethanol. Animals cannot eat wood and paper residues. I mean, maybe, maybe goats can, but not other types of animals. And so ethanol plants would prefer to make a profit from all parts of the feedstock, and if they can't sell it for animal feed, well, what are they going to do with the co-products? This is something we need to resolve. Even dedicated crops can pose environmental concerns because when we plant lignocellulosic crops on marginal land, we could be destroying biodiversity inadvertently. Some proposed crops are exotic or invasive in nature, and that could pose a further threat to local biodiversity. And here, the food versus fuel debate is going to rear its head again, in that if it becomes profitable enough through a combination of subsidies and simply revenue, then many growers may decide to plant lignocellulosic crops instead of food. And then we're facing an issue again of competing, competing markets. Fortunately, there are a number of potential solutions. How can we achieve environmental quality without making any sector worse off economically speaking? There are potential solutions in the use of genetically modified crops, alternative biofuels, improved conversion processes, other renewable energy sources, and also simply living more energy efficient lifestyles. I have to admit I'm a big proponent of the use of transgenic crops. Um, this is actually a topic in which I've been working now for a number of years. Um, one, of the, one of the first crops on which I performed research was Bt corn, which is a variety of genetically modified corn that produces its own pesticide. Because it has lower insect damage, there's overall more biomass to be converted into ethanol, and there's also indirectly lower mycotoxin levels. If you don't have insect damage on a plant, you're going to have less fungal colonization. 
And this can result in more efficient conversion of the corn to ethanol and have healthier co-products for animal feed. And in fact, um, several colleagues of mine and I have recently won a grant from the USDA Biotechnology Risk Assessment Grant to look at the extent to which there is this potential improvement. Other possibilities in transgenic technologies include creating crops that are more stress tolerant so, and more drought resistant so they can grow on marginal lands and improve fuel conversion, that is, genetically engineering corn to produce more easily fermentable starch. There are some new biofuels on the market. These include, for example, butanol, mixed alcohols, and biogas. I won't go into too much discussion of these, but suffice it to say that these are biofuels of the future. Right now, it's too costly to produce them in large amounts, but we can see that if we can lower the cost, then they have very good um, energy density. Um, now, there's also been some recent work as far as improved processes in thermochemical conversion through improved cat um, catalysis. For example, in terms of synthetic gas or syngas being converted into ethanol. Syngas is primarily composed of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and that is made by the gasification of carbon, any carbon-based material, under conditions of high temperature and pressure, and also in an oxygen-controlled atmosphere. In fact, even back in the 1970s, people were looking at ways that syngas could be converted into ethanol, but it wasn't really an efficient process back then because a lot of waste products were also being produced that were undesirable. But now research being done here at the DOE Ames Laboratory in conjunction with researchers at Iowa State University, including Victor Lin and Robert Brown in the audience, now have developed nanotechnology-based catalysts that can react with the syngas to better form ethanol, avoiding producing those unwanted waste products. The advantages in this case are that you can convert almost any carbon-based material to syngas, and this is a similar advantage to using feedstocks of cellulosic ethanol, and now it's just a matter of scaling this process up. Algae have also been considered as a potential biofuel source. Um, what I enjoyed about doing this research is that I learned new words like alga culture. Alga culture is farming algae for a variety of different purposes, including the production of biofuels. Algae can be met uh, metabolically altered such that they can generate high levels of oil, as much as 6,000 gallons of biofuel, specifically biodiesel, per acre of algae growing in water. There are some environmental benefits. You don't need to grow algae in fresh water. You can, use, uh, you can grow the algae in the ocean or you can use wastewater. The Department of Energy did a back of the envelope calculation that if algal fuel replaced all the petroleum being used now in the US, it would require an area to produce that algae that's just equivalent to the size of Maryland, which is a pretty small state. Some of the challenges include containment. What happens if the algae just starts to spread and then they get all over the water? We can't contain it. That is a problem. Temperature control is also an issue as far as producing the oils. And there are some pretty high infrastructure costs as well. There's also been a fair amount of research, not enough, not, not as much as I would like to see, but some related to true renewable sources of energy, including wind and solar power. The benefits of wind and sun-based energy are that, of course, they're plentiful, they're obviously renewable, widely distributed across the U.S. and across the world, they're clean, and in theory, they have zero greenhouse gas emissions. The current issues include the infrastructure costs and siting and transmission lines. But on that note, I want to point out um, one interesting policy development that's developed as far as windmills. Um, a, an American businessman by the name of T. Boone Pickens came out with a proposal in July of this year that we in America should invest $1 trillion in wind turbine farms to be sited throughout the Great Plains Wind Corridor. As you can see in this map of the U.S., the darker, the air, darker areas have actually more wind power associated with them, and you can see it's kind of a little bit west of here. And also, actually, this is a fairly windy place, too. The turbines would all be connected with one another in a power grid so that if there wasn't a whole lot of wind in one area, it wouldn't matter. There would be um, wind energy co coming from other parts of the United States. And the idea is that this wind-based energy could replace um, um, the natural gas that's currently forming electricity. And that displaced natural gas can fuel vehicles. Now, what are some of the benefits? If Higgins' plan came true in the best sense of the word, then that could, the, the wind could supply up to 20% of U.S. electricity needs. It could save the U.S. $300 billion annually in terms of um, reducing foil, foreign oil dependence. 
It could reduce greenhouse gas emissions because natural gas is actually lower polluting than gasoline. However, there are some other issues, such as the fact that transmission lines are expensive. Natural gas is still needed in peak electricity demands, and I don't know who's going to pony up a trillion dollars to pursue this. It might be, that might also be an issue. And finally, something over which we all have control is living more energy efficient lifestyles. As one of my colleagues pointed out earlier, it is in fact our insatiable demand for energy that drove up the price of oil in the first place that led us to be interested in pursuing ethanol. So in fact, I wouldn't even be standing here talking to you about this if in fact we simply lived more energy efficient lifestyles. So how can we change some lifestyles? Well, we can change issues um, involved with transportation or the ways in which we use and live in our buildings. As far as transport, the use of more fuel-efficient vehicles could be very ben beneficial as far as reducing our energy dependence. Using the mass transit system, using buses and trains where they exist, or simply bicycling or walking to work, to school, or wherever you have to go. As far as buildings, it turns out that our buildings in the U.S. use as much energy as transportation, and they're releasing twice as much greenhouse gas. Um, there are a variety of different things that we can do in our building environments that can help to reduce um, energy d dependence. For example, using more natural lighting from windows, for example, using compact fluorescent bulbs in our, in our rooms, turning off lights and appliances when we're not using them. And interestingly, I found what was called a small house society in the U.S. This is a society of people that are dedicated to actually moving into smaller homes and living more energy efficient lifestyles. So that does exist for anybody that's interested in it. To summarize, we can avoid a global energy crisis through the use of renewable fuel sources. Ethanol does have unique environmental benefits and risks compared with gasoline, and technology and the appropriate policies can help to make win-win situations for multiple sectors that also preserve environmental quality. There are other renewable sources and lifestyle changes that we should also be considering, though, in conjunction with ethanol production for a more energy secure future. And I just wanted to add some final thoughts. When I had the chance to do this work and to pull together all the research and read about it, I came to the conclusion that the topic of ethanol with relationship to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, I think that's already pretty well analyzed. I don't mean that we have all the answers. You could see that there were lots of disagreements as far as some of the numbers, but we have the models, we understand the problem well. I think an area that has received not enough focus is the impact on ethanol and ozone-related mortality. A 9% increase in mortalities related to increased ozone is not acceptable, at least from the point of view of a public health professor. We really need to pay more attention here. So a lot of environmental solutions currently focus on how we can produce energy more efficiently, but how can we reduce ozone pollution? This is something that I don't know. This, this is something that some engineers in the audience might know, or you might have some ideas about that. And I think it's important to focus some technology dollars and policy here, because if we're increasing the amount of ethanol that's being used in our fuel all over the U.S., we, don't want, we want to think of this problem ahead of time so that it doesn't become a crucial public health issue when there is more ethanol being burned. Finally, there are some people I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank Steve Kowaler, the Sigma Xi president-elect, for inviting me to speak here. It's great to have the chance to talk with all of you. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague Gary Mumfold in plant pathology for helping me with a number of different portions of this talk. Paul Bertels and Jeff Cooper of the National Corn Growers Association provided me with a lot of the data in this work. Um, a number of my colleagues at University of Pittsburgh also helped us, did my husband, Daniel Morris. And I'm happy to entertain any questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Felicia. If, if you do have a question, if I could ask you to step up to the microphone, unless you have a booming lecture hall voice like many of you have. I also like to point out that uh, some cookies and refreshments have snuck into the back, and you're welcome to partake of those afterwards. So if anybody has a question, or an answer for which yes. Felicia yes. can provide the question. Uh, I wonder if, um, in thinking through this increase in um, corn production and the, the possibility of taking grasslands and moving them into corn production, that really doesn't seem like a very good idea. 
I was been reading about the dust bowl, mm -hmm. and I don't think that we want to recreate that. And are, are you aware of whether people are really thinking through how to prevent that from happening? Um. Suzanne, if I understand your concern, it has to do with potential soil erosion that might have to do, might result from burning grasslands. Um, that, I don't, I'm not sure what has been done in that area. I guess the way that I had perceived that issue was that once the land had been burned, the crops would be planted there so that there would be, there would be plants there to anchor down the soil. I'm not too sure about that. There might be other people in the audience that know about that better than I do. That I'm not, yeah, I'm not too sure if anybody has looked at that issue. I read about a study which says that use of ethanol uh, causes an increase in global warming because it, uh, you convert uh, woodland to, to crops. Overall, it's bad for global warming. It's maybe a borderline. Have you heard of studies like that? Well, I, I presented some results from studies that looked, um, and I think I presented in a very sort of number intensive way. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at uh, potential global warming risk. In turn, well, not so much global warming risk, but the increase of greenhouse gas emissions such as carbon dioxide. Um, these studies have shown that just on a per unit basis, um, the production and the use of ethanol will, on average, produce less carbon dioxide than the same unit of energy of gasoline. And the main problem is the fact that we do have to burn some grasslands, some tropical rainforests, in order to provide enough land to produce those biofuels. Um, but over time, over a certain number of years, and nobody's sure how many years, that greenhouse gas debt will be repaid. So that overall it could actually be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Hi, Robert. Thanks, Howard. Good, thanks. Uh, your proposed study on the impact of uh, using ethanol VA5 increasing uh, respiratory distress or disease would be interesting to look at current technology on automobiles. So, a lot of the early work with ethanol engines was it was better mm -hmm. and it was going to reduce CO1, et cetera. Well, you know, that was. Uh, based on technology that nobody has under the hood of the cars anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, modern uh, computer-controlled uh, 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 fuel injection systems uh, pretty much uh, make the difference between an ethanol fuel and a hydrocarbon fuel disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that advantage on ethanol in terms of CO has disappeared. Has it? Oh, just it may also disappear in terms of things like the gas valve I don't know for certain, but you may want to make sure you're looking at the most recent data on automobiles before you look at the study that there may be very little difference anymore. Okay, thanks, Robert. So the idea is that actually it may not reduce the yeah, air pollution. Wow. Well, <laughs> okay. So this was in re um, regards to this particular yes. slide. All of the pollutants that I had put under ethanol use decreases all of those, maybe there's not in fact the decrease that we see because of different technologies and vehicles. Well, I'll, I'll take a look into that. Thank you for pointing that out, Robert. working on this and other things, I, I can't say that I know exactly what their stances are on ethanol. As far as I understand it, um, the McCain-Palin um, side has been interested in possibly using other, sort, other, other potential reserves of crude oil, for example, um, in, in, in Alaska. And the Obama admin, um, administration, <laughs> the Obama, <laughs> the Obama, Obama Biden side has been looking at the use of uh, clean coal technologies. Um, what can I say on those? Um, 
Um, I, can, I can comment more on the clean coal technology side that right now we don't necessarily have all of the technologies to guarantee clean coal, that the, um, the harvesting and also the burning of coal actually produces many, many pollutants that can have all kinds of adverse impacts in the water, in the soil, and in the air. Um, the idea that there might be some way to scrub coal and make it cleaner, I guess the question is, well, the, but the pollutants have to come out somewhere. Where are they going to go? Um, I think that another part of the um, clean coal technology idea is um, the idea of carbon sequestration. For example, uh, putting large pipes, injecting large pipes into the, into the soil and then pumping carbon dioxide back into the soil. Um, it's a fairly expensive technology, but, uh, it's, it's a fairly expensive technology, but there's a way that we can work on redu uh, potentially reducing the costs in the future. Um, as far as drilling other sources of oil, I mean, I suppose there's, um, I mean, there's, there's a way that maybe there could be a potential compromise in that um, we are concerned about the finite supply of oil. And as I mentioned in one of my earliest slides, oil f um, forms on a geologic time basis. I mean, it takes tens to hundreds of thousands of years for oil to reform. And so I would be hesitant to immediately support drilling other sources. But I think that it may be necessary to tide over energy demands. How's that for a very <laughs> kind of attempting to talk about the science. What I was thinking of was that Obama wants ethanol subsidies and McCain does not. Could you comment on that, whether that's good or not? Hmm. Comment on whether it's good to have ethanol subsidies. Let's put on your econ economics hat now. <laughs> <laughs> Subsidies are certainly useful in the beginning of any new technology because new technologies cost a lot. I mean, there are huge capital costs. I think that many of the technologies have already been worked out as far as how to produce corn-based ethanol. Not all of the technologies have been worked out as far as how to reduce the environmental impacts of the corn-based ethanol. I think that there might be an interest in shifting subsidies from the, um, what, what, is, what is already known about corn-based ethanol production and use toward technologies that can help to improve the environmental impacts of ethanol and also to promote cellulosic ethanol simply because um, cellulosic ethanol is a pretty hot new topic and it shows pretty um, good energy returns and has potential environmental benefits. So I guess my overall answer is you can, I, I do support subsidies, but for the right, for new, for new aspects of the problem, not the old ones. One could argue that the burning of fossil fuels in the last hundred years or so for transportation has been one large ecological experiment. And the, uh, the arguments are, are being made now that uh, it wasn't the right thing to do, and we need to uh, correct the, this course and adopt another approach. Uh, the burning of uh, ethanol for transportation in large quantities will be another environmental experiment or ecological experiment. Are you confident that we know enough about all the factors uh, involved in the use of ethanol so that in 100 years we won't be addressing a, a similar crisis brought on by the use of ethanol? That's a very good question. There are always potentially unknown risks to every new technology or every new method. Um, if you're asking me personally, I certainly don't think I know all of the potential risks that can be involved with ethanol burning. At the same time, if I were speaking back in 1908 and we're talking about the burning of gasoline, even if there were potential risks, I wouldn't say don't do it. I mean, the fact that we've been able to burn gasoline has resulted in enormous benefits in society. Yes, there have been some environmental tolls, there have been even been some human health impacts, but I mean, I think this is just an issue of having to weigh the benefits versus the costs. and. Um, in this case, we are trying to characterize what the potential risks could be um, pretty well, especially on the greenhouse gas side, not so much on the air, you know, the air pollution and human health side. And so I think there does, there does need to be more focus in that area. We have time for one last question. Mm -hmm. Why does burning ethanol produce so much more ozone compared to gasoline? That I'm not too sure. I, mean, I think there are some people in the audience that may know that better. I'm not, I'm not a chemist. Um, 
And we would have to do a penetration with a molecular structure of ethanol compared with a molecular structure of long chain hydrocarbons and what happens when it's combusted. I don't actually know the answer to that. So if anybody in the audience does. Um, too, too much oxygen. Too much oxygen. Okay. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and the, the long answer is probably more complicated, but yes, there's too much oxygen. The, the molecular formula of ozone is O3. Um, I have a question, but I'm going to ask it after we've had some lemonade and some cookies and things. So let's thank Felicia one more time. Can I ask one on Micah Talk? 